Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us as we continue the story of Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Blood Trail to Hell, by Casey Nash. Chapter 5. Jubal's Lawman's Career Begins Bonnie pointed. Lend a hand, and let's take the garbage out. The two of them helped the gunman to his feet. His face was a bloody, ugly mess. Pedro pointed to the back door. Please, take him out the back. The shooting, killing, and fighting has ruined my business. He threw his hands in the air in frustration and held open the kitchen door. Please, please, this way. Rosie gathered up the man's gun and hat. She handed the pistol to Peel, and because of the wounded man's drooping posture, she was able to stuff his hat down on his head, even though he was about six foot two. With a snarl, Peel said, Good readings, you killer. Jubal got up under one side of him and Monty the other. The man's head wagged from side to side, leaving blood on both of them. They finally got him into the jail after stopping three times to catch their breath. Let's put him in the back cell, said the sheriff as he gasped for air. Little did Jubal know it at the time, but over the next two years, he and Peel would repeat this task over and over as they kept law and order in the town of Palestine, the town where Jubal Stone's lawman career began. Lock that cell, Jubal, and bring the key. With a few turns to the left, Deputy Stone heard the lock click. He grinned as he pulled out the key. It was the first time he'd ever done that. Monty walked to the front door and stuck out his head. He spotted a boy walking by on the boardwalk. He yelled, Jess! Fetch the doc. Yes, sir, Sheriff. Jess lit a shuck from the doctor's office, but when he arrived, no one was there. He ran all over town, calling out. Anybody seen Dr. Reeves? Sheriff needs him. Peel stepped over to his desk and pulled out the top drawer. He tossed a deputy's badge on the table. Let's get you sworn in, Jubal. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. Stone did as he was told and repeated the words of the sheriff. Then he picked up the shiny badge and proudly pinned it on his shirt. If Pa could see me now, he'd be proud, Jubal, but you'll need more than a badge for this job. He spun and pulled the pistol from his belt that Rosie had given him and spun it on his fingers. When it stopped, the butt was facing Jubal. See how this one fits your grip. No reckon the bigot in there will need it where he's headed. Jubal reached and took the Colt in his hand. Feels mighty good. He rolled the chambers up and down his sleeve. Peel wasn't surprised by his weapon acumen, given Joe Stone was his paw. I figured your pappy learned you about pistols. Yeah, but we had to sneak around Mrs. Millie. Ma didn't like guns and frowned when we went out for a shoot. There was a knock at the door. Come on in, it's unlocked, barked Peel. It was Percy Ledbetter, the town undertaker. He had something tucked under his arm. Sheriff, I figured you would want to add this to your collection. Percy pulled out the rolled-up holster with a pistol in it and laid it on the desk. It was the rig owned by the man Monty killed in the diner. Oblige, Percy. Check in later. He threw a thumb toward the cells. May have another customer for you. We'll see what the doc says when he gets here. Percy's words caused Jubal to look at his knuckles, all of which were bleeding. His mind ran backwards to that evening in Hollis Johnson's barn, where he fought his cousins and uncle. Ledbetter tipped his hat. Good day, Sheriff Peel, and to you. He saw the tin badge on Jubal's shirt. Deputy. Jubal Stone's his name. Deputy Stone. Percy started to pull the door closed when suddenly his eyes widened and he pushed back through. Are you kin by chance to Joe Stone? Jubal stepped forward. Not by chance, by blood. He was my pa. Ah, a lawman among lawmen. You knew my pa? Jubal stepped closer. Well, let's just say he was good for my business. We spoke fairly regularly when he was a sheriff of Palestine. The sheriff of Palestine? exclaimed Jubal. He looked over at Peel, who was grinning like a possum. That's right, Jubal. Your pa cleaned the town up, and I was one of his deputies. Percy waved and eased the door closed. 
Good day, gentlemen. Peel sat down at his desk, bent over, and pulled out the bottom drawer. He reached and retrieved the bottle of rye. The way this day started, I need a snort. How about you, Jubal? Can you drink like you can fight? He grabbed two coffee cups behind him and poured two fingers in each. I, I don't know, Jubal chuckled nervously. I've never tried the stuff. Well, son, you and I are about to embark on an illustrious journey together. I'm going to teach you everything I know about becoming a lawman, just like your pa taught me. He picked up the cups full of spirits and handed Jubal one. The Joe Stone, the best dang lawman to ever set a boot in Texas. Jubal wasn't about to pass up a chance to honor his pa, even though drinking liquor around the Stone homestead was forbidden. He raised his cup. The Joe Stone. Before he took a sip, he whispered, I hope Ma ain't watching from up yonder. Over the next few weeks, Sheriff Peel and Deputy Stone were inseparable. Every day, it seemed, brought a new lesson for Jubal to learn, and he didn't forget one of them. Peel marveled at how quickly young Stone was honing his lawman skills. He took to the profession like a duck to water. Word spread quickly around town of Jubal's bare-knuckle fight with the big man in the diner. However, Jubal was not only fast with his fists, he was becoming pretty handy with a gun. Daily, he practiced shooting and drawing iron, but always out of sight. One day, Monty happened upon him in a wash two miles out of town. From a hundred yards away, tucked away in some brush, the sheriff watched Jubal in action through his binoculars. He had never seen anyone faster and more accurate with a pistol than Deputy Jubal Stone. It put him in mind of another fast gun hand, Joe Stone. As Peel watched Jubal, he noticed the young man's unique way of drawing out his shooting iron and fired just as the barrel cleared the holster. He'd never before seen anyone else do that. This habit would save his life and many others over the next few years, giving him just the edge he needed to fire first. Monty knew Jubal was good with a gun, but he had yet to be tested. Then one night, three highbinders rode into Palestine. Anyone could tell by a quick glance that these men were dangerous killers, desperados on the run. They came into the Hog's Breast Saloon, shooting their guns and flipping over tables. Bert, one of the barkeeps, slipped out the back and went for the sheriff. Stopping on the stoop, he pounded on Peel's door. Sheriff! Sheriff! Come quick! Monty opened the door and yelled, What in Sam Hill, Bert? As he quickly buckled on his gun belt, grabbed one of the shotguns out of the holder, and pulled on his hat. Three men! They're shooting up the place! Hurry, Sheriff! They're gonna kill everybody if they haven't already! Peel waved his hand. All right, Bert. Settle down. I'll handle this. You fetch Jubal. He's down yonder at Tom Brown's house, sparking his daughter. In the distance, there were more gunshots. Steely-eyed and mad, Peel stared in that direction. He didn't like anybody shooting up his town, especially strangers. However, Monty made a tin-horn mistake. He didn't check the shotgun for a load. He had cleaned it earlier and planned to reload it when the oil in the barrel was dry. Bert reached the Browns' house and pounded on the door. Jubal! Jubal! Tom Brown jerked open the door and stared curiously at Bert. What can I do for you? Jubal was standing behind him. He looked past Brown. Jubal, Sheriff Peel needs you at the Hog's Breast Saloon. Stone turned and said goodnight to Becky, then grabbed his hat and gun hanging by the door. Let's go, Bert. He tipped his hat to Mr. Brown. Good night, sir. Sheriff Peel stepped through the double doors, loaded for bear. Just as he did, one of the high binder's pistols flared. He was firing at some bottles on the bar. That'll be enough of that. With shotgun waist high and finger firmly against the trigger, Monty stood ready to deliver the buckshot in any direction needed. Well now, Sheriff, came a voice from the back corner. You figured to take the three of us. Monty pointed the scatter gun in his direction. If need be, they chuckled. Jubal stepped through the swinging doors and moved slowly across the room, weaving his way through those lying on the floor as he kept his eyes peeled on the misbehaving visitors. Mind if I join the party, Sheriff? Jubal's heart was hammering as he lowered his hand to his colt. Not a mind at all, Deputy. This is between me and the Sheriff, Blackjack. He's mine, argued the fellow who was shooting bottles from the bar when Monty arrived. The man reached for his gun. Peel pulled the trigger on the shotgun, and instead of a bang, there was a click. 
The highbinder's bullet struck the sheriff in the shoulder. He fell backwards to the floor. Jubal pulled iron and sent two bullets into the man's chest. His two friends reached for their pistols, but Stone dissuaded them as he pointed his cannon their way. Shuck them hog legs and throw up your hands. You're under arrest. Blackjack put his thumbs in his belt and smiled as he pushed up and down on the tips of his boots, the epitome of a confident, egotistical killer. Boy, who do you think you're talking to? Well, I'm Blackjack Tanner. There was a gasp from those in the room. They all now knew who this man was. He was one of the most notorious killers who ever rode across the frontier, believed to have snuffed out the lives of over 30 men. A few of them wore badges. Jubal was not impressed, neither was he intimidated. Well, Blackjack Tanner, if you and your partner don't drop your guns, you'll be joining your friend here on the floor. He gestured with the barrel of his pistol towards the dead man. Peel had gotten to his knees and pulled his colt. His face twisted in pain. Best do as he says. He thumbed back the hammer. This one's loaded. He glanced at Jubal and shook his head, disgusted that he had not checked a shotgun before coming to the fight. Blackjack smirked. Ain't no sport in shooting a man without giving him a chance, is there, friend? With steely eyes darting back and forth from Jubal to Peel, he waited for an answer. In the nervous silence, his partner added his two bits. From that slick spot in his head, Blackjack, I reckon the boy to be scared and scarred. <laughs> Snickering, he slapped the top of the table beside him. Jubal's anger burned. He turned his pistol toward the fool who'd just spoken. Hey, Big Mouth, unbuckle your gun belt before I shoot you between the eyes. Then me and Mr. Tanner here can get on with our business. Go ahead, Kane. Do as he says. Tanner smiled with confidence as he stared at Jubal believing the lawman was going to try his luck. Peel ordered Kane to take three steps away from his gun, now laying on the floor. He did. Jubal kept his pistol pointed toward Tanner. Now I'm doing you a favor and giving you a sporting chance, ain't that right? Blackjack smiled. <laughs> yeah, but what are you getting at? I got a favor to ask of you. Kane chuckled, clapped his hands, and stomped his foot to the hardwood floor. <laughs> You're a dead man, boy. Shut up, Kane, barked Tanner as he stared angrily in his direction. Looking back to Jubal, he said with condescension leaking from his mouth, And what can I do for you, son? Peel kept his colt trained on Kane, perplexed at where Jubal was going with this. He himself didn't make a habit of having a long conversation with gunslingers and questioned young Stone's wisdom but he was bound to stay in the buggy and see where it stopped. You ever hear of a fellow that goes by the name Tobias Fletcher? Jubal asked with searching eyes. Tobias Fletcher? Blackjack looked to the ceiling and back to Jubal. I know him. Why? What's your business with Fletcher? Jubal grinned and with his left hand pointed to the scar in his temple. He and his boys gave me this. I aim to pay him back. Know his whereabouts? Tanner smirked. Well, if you live past meeting up with me, I hear he owns a ranch north of Austin. Stone eased his pistol back into leather and raised his hand slightly above the pistol grip. Oblige for the information. Now, unbuckle your gun and drop it to the floor. You're under arrest for disturbing the peace and resisting arrest. Tanner spat and wiped his mouth. Not hardly. He reached and drew his gun with lightning speed. Two shots rang out, but only one man was left standing. Jubal Stone. His left arm was bleeding just above his elbow. Blackjack Tanner's body was a quiver. Kane's mouth flung open as he stared down at his partner's dead body sprawled oddly across the floor. Tanner's left arm was pinned behind his back as if someone put it there. A puddle of blood was not connecting next to him. Didn't figure nobody could outdraw Blackjack Danner. Didn't figure it was possible. Let's go, Kane, barked the sheriff. Got a bunk for you down at the jail. The room came alive with celebration as people got back to their feet and headed toward the bar. Several on their way patted Jubal on the shoulder. Bully for you, Jubal. 
Stone stood with a blank stare, peering down at Blackjack's corpse as if he was in a daze. It was his first kill. The Jubal Stone, someone yelled. The man who killed Blackjack Tanner. Everybody raised their glasses and drank down the liquor. Heel wave came towards him. The outlaw walked past Jubal and stopped to pay his respects to Tanner, which seemed less than sincere. You old sorry cuss, he grinned. You always said you'd cheat the rope. He kicked Tanner's boot and leaned down. Told you, big brother, that one day you'd get yearn. <laughs> you chuckled all the way to the door. Someone at the bar mumbled. They were brothers? Immediately, the room filled with chatter as the crowd moved toward the bar. Jubal, however, had not moved since firing his gun. He looked more like a slab of granite than a man as he stared down at Tanner's corpse. Sheriff Peel knew firsthand what it was like to kill your first man, even in the line of duty. He pursed his lips and called out, Jubal! Deputy Jubal Stone! The whole saloon became quiet as they turned toward Jubal, who stood. Finally, he blinked his eyes and made eye contact with Peel. Yes, sir. Take Kane here and put him in a cell. If he gives you any trouble, shoot him. If my count is correct, you got three more bullets in that shooter. Don't forget to reload. He grinned through his pain. You see what happens when you come to a fight with an unloaded gun. Jubal smiled and pointed to his wounded arm. Yeah, and sometimes even when you do. Bert helped the sheriff to the doctor's office while Jubal escorted Kane to jail. Neither of the men spoke a word between them until Kane was standing behind bars. Now one won't be in your shoes, son, he chuckled. From now on, every gunslinger on the frontier will come to call on the man who shot Blackjack Tanner. Jubal didn't say a word as he turned the key and pulled on the door to make sure it locked. As he walked away, Kane followed him on the other side of the iron bars. Not only that, Blackjack had friends, lots of them, and ain't nothing they'd rather do than put a hole through that badge you're wearing. As Jubal pulled the door closed between the cells and the office, Kane shouted, You hear me, boy? They'll be coming for you. That night, as Jubal sat on his bunk inside the jail, he pulled out the picture of his family and wept. Lots of emotions were flooding his mind. He had killed a man. Although Blackjack was one of the most evil humans who ever wore skin, he was still a man, and Jubal had ended his life. He wondered, as he stared deeply at the family photograph, how his ma would have looked upon his deed. Then his attention shifted to his pa. The undertaker's words rang in his ears. He was a lawman among lawmen. He was good for business. Jubal realized in that moment that wearing a badge and toting a gun would necessitate the use of deadly force. It would also give him the authority to hunt down his family's killers, bringing them to justice or to death. For the next few weeks, with the help of Peel, inquiries were sent to lawmen all across the state of Texas, asking about the whereabouts of Tobias Fletcher. Monty contacted the sheriff of Austin personally, but he knew nothing of the man except what was on some old wanted posters. Sitting on the bench outside the jail, Peel and Stone looked up and down the street. All was quiet and calm, just the way lawmen like it. I figure Fletcher changed his handle, Jubal. He'd be a fool not to. Stone's face wrinkled with disappointment as he pushed his knife the length of the small stick he was whittling on. I take a vow, Sheriff. I won't stop hunting that killer until I have him in my sights. Jubal drew out his pistol and looked down the barrel. Peel knew he meant what he said. He'll turn up, Jubal. Peel straightened up on the bench, still nursing his sore shoulder. Son, I want to tell you something. I ain't no preacher or philosopher, but I've lived long enough to back the words I'm about to say. I'm all ears, Sheriff. You know I value what you say. Oblige, Jubal. You know you're more like a son to me than just my deputy. Jubal removed his hat. Well, seeing that I ain't got no paw, I put a value on what you just said. Peel continued. Son... You've got real talent with that gun, and you ain't no tin horn with them fist in your either. Jubal chuckled. I believe before the sun sets on you that you'll be ever bit the lawman your pa was. Maybe even better. Jubal rolled his hat around between his hands. 
I don't know about all that. The way folks talk around here, Paul was a legend. Yeah? And do you know why? I reckon his fast gun and hard fists. Well, that's part of it. But Joe Stone was always in control of his faculties. Faculties? What do you mean by that? His temper, Jubal. He didn't let men like Black Jack Tanner goad him into gunplay. Jubal rubbed his chin. Yeah, thinking back on that, I could have gotten myself killed. Peel slapped Jubal in the leg. You dang right you could have, and others to boot. I've seen many a stray bullet kill innocent folks. In other words, Sheriff, that was a dang fool thing I did. Isn't that what you're saying? Jubal, sometimes as lawmen, we will be forced into gunplay. Just don't let men like Tanner and his mongrels get under your skin and make you do something you'll regret if you live through it. I'll work on that, Sheriff. Son, I think it's about time you call me Monty, at least in private. <laughs> Obliged, Monty. He pulled on his hat and stood to his feet. As he looked across the street, he saw Becky going into one of the merchantile stores. Mm, believe I'll stretch my legs a bit. Peel saw Becky too and grinned. <laughs> I don't blame you. Tell her hello for me. Jubal walked across the street and greeted Tom Brown, who was sitting in his buckboard. Hello, Mr. Brown. How are you today? Tom had always been friendly to Jubal, though he was a fine, manly young man. But since a gunplay in the saloon a few weeks ago, Brown had become uneasy with Becky dating what he called a gun hand. He tipped his head. Mr. Stone. Mr. Stone, thought Jubal. Becky's father had never called him by his last name before. And today, Mr. Brown seemed very unfriendly. Becky came out of the store with an armload of goods. Jubal rushed onto the boardwalk to assist her. Why, Miss Becky Brown, you sure are looking pretty today. Here, let me help you with those packages. She smiled nervously, then looked over at her father. Thank you, Jubal, but I can manage. She said as she tucked the packages from his grip. Tom stepped down from the wagon. Hurry along, Becky. Your ma's waiting on us at the diner. Jubal looked like a man who had just gotten a saddle stolen off his horse. He pulled off his hat and waved from the boardwalk, perplexed. As the Browns pulled away, Becky looked around with sad eyes but received a quick reprimand from her paw. Jubal Stone was learning quickly that there was a high price to be paid for wearing a badge. One moment, the townspeople were raising their glasses to him, and the next, they were labeling him as a gunman, someone who men warn their daughters to avoid. Monty watched from the bench. He knew exactly how Tom Brown felt about his daughter's sparking Deputy Stone, especially since the shootout at the Hogsbreath Saloon. Brown had told them a couple of days ago while standing outside the livery that he didn't want Jubal calling on Becky anymore. However, Peel knew Jubal would have to sort this out for himself, so he went back inside his office and shut the door. Jubal had hung his hat in Palestine for over two years now. Monty, as hard as it was for him to admit it, knew it was time for him to relocate. He had taught Jubal what he needed to know and knew he was ready for his next assignment, being sheriff of his own town. A couple of days after Becky's rejection, Jubal received a letter from the mail. It was from the town council of Glen Rose, Texas. They wanted him to come and interview for the position of sheriff. Jubal couldn't believe what he was reading. As he sat in the chair next to Peel's desk, he brushed the paper with his hand and looked up. Well, what do you think of that, Pa? Sheriff Jubal Stone. Peel walked in and hung his hat on the peg. He could tell Jubal was reading something that excited him. What you got there in your grip, Jub? That's a nickname he grew fond of using for him. Monty, Monty. They want me to come to Glen Rose and jaw with them about becoming their sheriff. Peel smiled and poured himself a cup of coffee. You don't look too surprised, Monty. Well, son, I knew it was just a matter of time before a town will be calling on you. Yeah, Jubal smiled. But it's more than that, he held up the letter. I figured you had something to do with this. Monty went to his desk and set down his cup. Spinning on his heels, he pointed at Jubal. You dang right I did. With tears in his eyes and with a broken voice, he pointed. Now you go, and you make me and your paw proud. In Jubal's excitement of the prospects of sheriffing in Glen Rose, he had overlooked the cost of leaving. 
His bond with Monty had grown stronger and stronger over the two years he'd been in Palestine. Peel was the closest thing to family he had. Everything he knew about being a lawman, he learned from his mentor, Monty Peel. Chapter 6 Showdown with Little Texas Jubal arrived by train in Glen Rose to five friendly faces, men who made up the town council. They walked him around town, introducing him to the merchants, the banker, and the doctor. Everyone was impressed with Jubal. His reputation preceded him. He spent the weekend in Glen Rose, and just an hour before boarding a train back to Palestine, he was offered the job of sheriff. Mayor Jack Livingstone pinned the star to his shirt and gave him a hearty handshake. Stone had never felt more privileged than now, but he would soon feel the heavy weight of the responsibility of being top lawman in a Texas frontier town. Step up here, folks, and shake the hand of Glen Rose's new sheriff, Sheriff Jubal Stone. Over 60 people filled the streets, men, women, and children, congratulating Jubal with handshakes and smiles. Then Stone boarded the train for Palestine. He had some packing to do. The evening before Jubal left town, Monty threw him a little going-away party. About 20 people were in attendance. They all thanked Jubal for helping to keep Palestine safe during his tenure. Mr. Barnwell, the mayor, gave him $50 as a stake to get him started. Rosie gave him a big kiss on the cheek and said, Don't you forget us. <laughs> Never, Jubal replied as he stood and hugged her. Then suddenly, a hush fell over the saloon at the sound of hooves pounding the hardwood floor. When Jubal turned around, he saw Sheriff Peel leading the prettiest roan he'd ever seen. Monty handed him the reins. He's yearns. Found him wandering around down at the library. Jubal had ogled this horse many times as he walked by Hank Ford's library. Ford had him up for sale, but the price was too steep for anyone around Palestine to afford. Monty, he's a beauty. I reckon you'll be eating rice and beans this next year to pay for him. Me and Rose didn't want you to be mounted on no crow bait up there in Glen Rose. Hank threw in the tack. He said you'd done more for the people of Palestine than they'd ever know. Bert came running around from behind the bar with the raced broom. Sheriff, get that animal out of here. This ain't no water and trial for horse. This is a saloon. He rubbed down his apron and stood up straight. And a respectable one at that. Everyone laughed, including Bert. He stuck out his hand to Jubal. I wish you the best, Sheriff Stone. <laughs> Obliged, Bert. Stone leaned into Bert. Keep the hog's breath clean at the likes of Black Jack and his bunch. Jubal then looked around the room and smiled. These last two years in Palestine have been good ones, because of folks like you. I'd like to play you something. He dropped the reins, reaching into his coat, and pulled out the flute that Frank had given him. Tapping it against his leg, he put it to his lips and his finger in the holes. Immediately, a beautiful tune filled the room. It was the same one Frank had played for him that dark Texas night aboard the midnight train. When he finished, the saloon erupted in applause. That's my boy, said Sheriff Peel. Good with his fists, his gun, and his flute. Looks like shooting that pistol ain't the only thing you've been practicing out there at the wash. Play, Jubal. Play. Ain't that what Frank told you? <laughs> it is, answered a smiling stone as he pulled open his coat and stuffed the flute back down into an inner pocket, revealing the shiny tin star attached to his shirt. Say, now look at here, folks. Peel bent his thumb towards Jubal's chest. That there's a sheriff badge. Monty waved his hands in the air and his eyes widened as he stood up on a chair. Now listen up, everybody. Best be on your best behavior if you go to Glen Rose, you'll have to answer to Sheriff Jubal Stone. His words could prove to be true, but at this moment, he spoke them in jest. Jubal shook his head and patted Monty on the shoulder as he offered his shoulder to help him down from the chair. Monty responded back with a wink. Anyone could tell these two men had a strong bond between them. The next morning, Jubal went down to the train depot and bought a one-way ticket to Hillsboro for him and the roan. He had been riding one of Peel's horses during his time in Palestine. Now he had his own, and what a dandy the big gelden was. The town of Hillsboro was about 50 miles southeast of Glen Rose. This would give Jubal and his red roan he'd already named Red 
time to get acquainted. When he secured his ticket, he looked up the street to the jail. He decided to have breakfast with his friend one last time. He stepped onto the boardwalk quietly and eased into Peels' office, where he caught him asleep on his bunk. Wake up, fellow. Let's go wrap our mouths around some biscuits and bacon. Monty slowly opened his eyes and rubbed them as he focused on Jubal, who was standing before him. Ugh, seems like I spoke them words to you a couple years back when you were sleeping under Hank's lean-to. <laughs> That's right, you did. At least you don't have a murder charge hanging over you like I did that day. Monty sat up on his bunk and pulled on his boots. So, you're going to buy me breakfast, are you? <laughs> yes, sir. All the biscuits and bacon you can swallow. You mean I ain't going to get my usual? Jubal put out his hand and pulled Monty up off the bunk. <laughs> we'll see what Rosie says. How about that? Monty scratched his head and his face wrinkled. Shoot, she'll want to serve me lunch instead of breakfast. Well, if you married her, you could get breakfast, lunch, and supper. Me? Married? He rubbed his chin and reached up for his hat hanging on the peg. Hmm. I'll have to give that a little more thought. As the men walked out the door and onto the boardwalk, Jubal put out his hand and stopped as if he was protecting Peel and himself from stepping on a rattler. He stared down at the hitch, then back over his shoulder. You ever see better horse flesh than that's what's tied yonder at the rail? Monty smiled. He's a fine looking pony. Almost as looks him as old dollar. That was the sorrel the sheriff rode. After breakfast, Jubal said his goodbyes, and with one final look back over his shoulder at Palestine, led right up into the livery car, and the two of them got settled in for the 50 mile train ride. Jubal reached into his saddlebag hanging over an iron rod affixed to the wall and pulled out a brush. Red nibbled at the hay above him while his new owner ran the brush through his mane, then over his back and down his legs. With each stroke, Jubal talked to Red like he was a human. Red, you and I are going to make our home in Glen Rose for a spell. From what I've seen, that town has some good folks. I figure there's a few ornery cusses as well, but nothing that we can't handle. After a few minutes, Jubal put down the brush and lay down next to Red's front hooves before falling asleep. A couple of hours later, he awoke to his train jerking back and forth as it stopped to take on water. When he rose up from the straw, Red was staring him in the face. The gelding had decided he too would lie down. It took a better part of a day before they reached Hillsboro. Jubal slung the saddle up on Red and put on his bridle. He pulled open the door and both he and the big roan walked down the wooden ramp that the rail workers had attached to the car when the train stopped. Hillsboro was a bustling little Texas town, made up of his own unique sounds and smells. As Jubal sat atop Red at the edge of town, he was surprised by the amount of people walking up and down boardwalks and the number of stores and merchants that littered Main Street. He reached down and patted the gelding on the neck. Well, Red, let's you and me see what Hillsboro is all about, shall we? As he leaned forward, the roan took his cue and moved toward town. The sun was setting, and the kerosene lanterns lining the street were being lit. Jubal pulled up on the reins in front of the Silver Spoon Cafe. From the number of horses tied out front, including a couple of teams hooked up buckboards, Stone figured this was a good place to get some vittles. He stepped down out of the saddle and hitched Red to the rail. Just as he was climbing the steps out in front of the cafe, a cowboy rode up on a flea-bitten gray. He raised his reins and slapped them against Red as he kicked at him with his boot. Move over, house. Red crow hopped and pulled against his reins. Hold up there, mister, yelled Jubal. You've got no cause to abuse my horse. The man's name was Harley Tucker, the town menace. Every time he came to Hillsboro, he got into a ruckus with somebody. Today, it just happened to be Jubal Stone. He jumped down from his horse and stepped up in Jubal's face. What are you going to do about it, boy? Harley shoved Stone backwards, but Jubal held his temper, remembering what Monty had told him. Just saying I don't cotton to anybody laying a hand on my horse. Don't reckon you would want me doing the same to yearn. Tucker chuckled. You did. I'll beat you till you couldn't walk. He spat toward Red, but Harley didn't know when to quit. He rubbed his scraggly beard and looked up and down Jubal. Say, boy, looks like somebody already given you a beating. He raised his fingers to his temple. Before Tucker knew it, he was lying in a pile of horse manure next to the hitching post. Jubal knocked him slam off the boardwalk. Harley shook his head, wondering where he was and what had happened. 
Then he rose to a sitting position and saw Jubal, the man who had hit him with a powerful uppercut. He touched his hand to his nose, then stared down at his palm. There was blood filling the creases in his hands. As he looked down to his shirt, it was quickly turning crimson red. Jubal pulled back his coat and put his hand to his hips. That's when Harley saw his badge. Now, mister, if you want to continue this, I'll oblige you, but I'd rather go in yonder and get some supper. Stone turned and looked at the cafe door, then back to Harley, waiting for his response. Didn't know you were a law dog. He spit blood. Jubal remembered his badge was pinned to his shirt. He looked down and back over his shoulder with a smile and with pride answered, I'm the sheriff of Glen Rose. Jubal Stone's my name. Harley's eyebrows rose to an arch on his forehead. He got to his feet and quickly dusted the manure from his britches. Then he stared up a stone. You the man who killed Black Jack Tanner in Palestine? Jubal glanced nervously to his left and right to see if anybody was listening. Sure enough, there was one old man sitting in the bench next to the door who had his hand to his ear leaning his way. Yeah, I am. Harley quickly untied his horse and pulled them away from the hitch as he kept his eye on Jubal. He tripped a couple of times as he walked sideways and stared at Stone. He pointed. There's me more room over yonder across the street. He and his chestnut trotted away. Jubal wagged his head and walked through the door of the restaurant. He was surprised that word spread so quickly of his killing Tanner. Suddenly, he remembered what Black Jack's brother had told him as he put him behind bars in Palestine. Table for one, sir. As the old bald-headed gentleman, Jubal removed his hat. Yes, sir. Just one. The old man who had been sitting on the bench outside rushed through the doors. He was the man who had eavesdropped on his exchange with Tucker. Soon, several men dressed in fine clothes arose from their chairs. One of them had the old gent raise a glass. The Jubal Stone, the lawman, who riddled the frontier of Black Jack Tanner. The whole restaurant erupted in cheers and applause. Jubal never felt more uncomfortable in his life. He didn't like the attention, even it was for killing the infamous Black Jack Tanner. In fact, that reason alone made him even more uncomfortable. All he wanted was a meal and a soft bed for the night. The owner of the cafe hurried over and escorted him to a corner table. Follow me, Mr. Stone. With an open hand, he said, I hope this fits your fancy. Thank you, sir. It's fine. Jubal sat down while the people were still standing. Your meal is on the owner of this establishment, the tall, bald-headed man said with a strange giddiness. That's me, Walter Butler, at your service. Oblige, Walter, but I have money. Sorry, Mr. Stone, but your money is no good in my restaurant tonight, he nodded. Enjoy your meal. A pretty young blonde came over to take Jubal's order. She wasn't nearly as impressed with him as Butler. What can I get for you, cowboy? With pad in hand, she looked across the room, smiling at a man sitting with two others in the corner. Jubal looked around her and saw the grinning fellow. You two must know each other. Her eyes cut back his way. Yes, I know, Billy, she said forcefully. That's none of your mix, is it? Stone raised his hand. No, ma'am. I just came in for some supper. Didn't mean to rile you. Billy's head popped up like a gopher out of a prairie hole. Then he rose to his feet and walked straight towards Jubal's table. Stone could tell by the young man's expression that he was mad. Is everything all right over here, Linda? Linda smiled. Yeah, Billy, you, you best go on back to your table before Pa sees you. He thinks this man is some hero or something. Billy sighed. He don't look like all that much to me. Jubal stood up. He was about a head taller than the young buck. Now, friend, he rubbed the scar on his temple that often pained him. I've got me a headache that just won't quit. Just came in for some vittles and then I'll be on my way. Butler came out of the kitchen with a pot of coffee. Linda May he said in a scolding tone. Why is Billy Cole over here bothering Mr. Stone? Before Linda May could answer, Jubal came to her rescue. Mr. Butler, I was just jawing with Billy about where to board my horse for tonight. Stone held out his hand. Thanks for the information, Mr. Cole. Billy looked confused. His eyes darted from Jubal to Mr. Butler to Linda. Then he reached and shook Stone's hand. Glad I could help. Welcome to Hillsboro. He turned and went back to his table. Linda stormed off into the kitchen as Walter poured Jubal some coffee. 
I don't know what's gotten into that girl. That Billy Cole hasn't got a nickel to his name. I prefer she not mingle with his kind. Butler's words gnawed at Jubal like a dog on a bone. It put him in mind of Tom Brown, Becky's father back in Palestine, who forbade his daughter to see him. In that moment, Jubal knew exactly how Billy felt. I wouldn't count that boy out, Mr. Butler. Might be he'll turn out to be a fine man, one you'd be proud to know. Walter looked Billy's way inside. Then he lowered his voice and leaned into Jubal. Billy's what we call a seven by nine fellow. I want better for Linda. Jubal filled his mouth with a gulp of coffee to keep from lighting into Butler full hog. Then the cafe owner surprised him with a question. Are you married, Mr. Stone? Jubal almost spilled his coffee. He set down the cup and swallowed hard. <clears throat> Me? Married? No, sir. Linda walked by carrying a tray with three plates of stew and a basket full of rolls. Her father stepped in front of her. Wait, Linda. He picked up one of the bowls and set it down in front of Stone, along with the rolls. But Pa, protested his daughter, that was for the three gentlemen at the table by the wall. Her words earned her a quick reprimand. Linda, I don't consider Billy Cole a gentleman. Now if you have a mind to, go back to the kitchen and fill up another bowl. With that, Walter turned to Jubal and said with a wide smile, Enjoy your stew, Mr. Stone. There was more where that came from. Then he walked away to tend to some other customers. Linda went back into the kitchen, furious. Jubal picked up the spoon next to the bowl and stared at the soup. Then he looked across to Billy, who was glancing his way. Butler's back was now to Jubal and Billy. With a grin, Stone waved Billy over. Reluctantly, Billy came to his table. I believe this is yearn. God by mistake. He leaned back and raised his hands. Billy looked to Mr. Butler. His back was still turned his way. Obliged. He grabbed up the bowl and hightailed it back to his chair. Linda came out of the kitchen like it was on fire. Holding the tray stocked with three bowls of soup and rolls, Linda passed by Jubal and shot an angry glare his way. He nodded. Ma'am. A couple of minutes later, she returned, but this time with a sheepish look on her face. I'm obliged for what you did for Billy twice. Pa can't abide him. Butler looked over and saw Jubal and Linda talking. Well, now, he put his arm to Linda's back. I see you two getting acquainted. Linda, Mr. Stone here was a fine young lawman. Kill Black Jack Tanner, don't you know? Yes, Pa, Mr. Stone is a real gentleman. Linda said it as if she meant it. Excuse me, I've got a place to serve. Going to be in town long, Sheriff? Jubal reared back in the chair and clasped his hands to the back of his head. No, sir. Pulling out at daybreak. He'll be expecting me in Glen Rose directly. Butler put a hand to the back of one of the empty chairs. Oh, Glen Rose. That's a fine town. I hear they have some fine restaurants there, but not as fine as mine. He chuckled and wiped off his section of the table with the cloth he was holding. You be sure to spread the word to the townspeople to visit my establishment if they're ever in Hillsborough. Jubal was finishing up his last bite of soup. He nodded at a butler, but as he glanced across the room, he saw a man staring a hole through him. A mean-looking cuss who wore a snarl. Stone stood and shook Mr. Butler's hand and thanked him again for his hospitality. When he started to step away from the table, however, he noticed the man who had been staring at him was gone. Jubal opened the door and stepped out of the stoop slowly as he looked to his left and right. Then he heard a voice. Over here, Stone. It was a stranger from inside, and he was standing in the middle of the street, waving Jubal toward him. Stone reached and unlatched his colt. Then he stepped off the boardwalk and into the street. Who are you, mister? To my knowledge, we've never met. They say you killed Black Jack Tanner. I'd say it's a dang lie. Tanner will be a friend of mine. The man dropped his hand down to his pistol. I figured you'd shoot him in the back or drag gulched him one. Either way, I'm here to settle the score. Name's Nick Slade, but they call me Little Texas. Jubal took a couple of more steps towards the gunman. I've heard of you, Slade. I'm taking you in. Just as Stone said those words, Deputy Sheriff Ty Rawls came running down the boardwalk, protesting gunplay in the streets. Slade drew his weapon and cut him down. Jubal started for his pistol, but Little Texas stopped him with a warning. I wouldn't do that, law dog. 
He had his cannon pointed Jubal's way. He held up a finger. Not just yet. He slowly put his gun back into leather and widened his stance. Jubal's fury burned. From his peripheral vision, he could see the body of a fellow lawman and deputy who was just trying to do his job hanging off the boardwalk. He could hear the wailing of several women off to his side. Unbuckle your gun, Slade. The outlaw had a colt on each hip. Little Texas chuckled. Boy, you've seen your last Texas sunrise. With that, he went for both pistols. Jubal's colt leapt out of leather and flared. Slade's guns barked as well, but both shots hit in front of Stone's boots. The outlaw staggered towards Jubal with guns raised. The young lawman fired two more shots, which both slammed into his opponent's chest, knocking him to the ground. Jubal's ability to fire from the hip had eliminated another frontier menace. The townspeople flooded the street to view little Texas's body. Jubal walked over to Red and rubbed his muzzle, looking back at the fees he had created with his gun. Stone stared into the dark, cold reality that the experience he had in Hillsborough this evening would now be a part and parcel of a lawman's life. Sheriff Enos Blount came riding up on his bay about five minutes later. He quickly dismounted and ran over to where his deputy lay. Bending down, he asked, Is he alive, Doc? The town doctor had his stethoscope to tie his chest. He slowly pulled him from his ears, and with sadness, shook his head. No, Ennis. <laughs> He's gone. That slave fellow lying yonder gunned him down. Sarah, Ty's mother, came running from the boardwalk screaming, No, no, not my Ty! No, God, no! Two of the ladies standing behind the sheriff and doctor grabbed hold of her. Sarah! Sarah! But she wouldn't be consoled. She pushed right through them to her son's side. With a loud wail, she laid her head against his chest. The doctor put a hand to her shoulder. I'm sorry, Sarah. Ty is gone. She rose up and fell into his arms, weeping uncontrollably. He pulled her to her feet and gently pushed towards the two ladies who had attempted to comfort her. Blount stood to his feet and looked a little Texas's corpse. Then he pulled his pistol and emptied five shots at the body at 25 yards away. The people scattered to get clear of the shooting. Jubal, like the other folks, was shocked by the sheriff's actions. Then he heard Blount's parting words to Slade and understood. You killed my nephew, my baby sister's only child, you devil. Standing less than a foot away, Ennis fired his last shot into the forehead of little Texas, then reloaded his pistol and stuck it in his holster. Jubal walked toward the sheriff and started to apologize. He felt somewhat responsible for what had happened. However, a man came running towards Blount. Sheriff, that there's Jubal Stone. Little Texas called him out. He had no choice but to brace him. I was going into the cafe when Mr. Stone here was coming out. Ennis looked Jubal's way, then back over to his shoulder to Slade. I heard he was in territory. Me and a posse were out looking for him about a week ago. Plum glad you bedded him down. Ennis stuck out his hand. Jubal was relieved that he wasn't blaming him for the gunfight. You've got some reward money coming to you. Slade was wearing a $5,000 reward on his head. Let's go to my office and fill out some papers. Jubal quickly protested. No, Sheriff. I ain't interested in that blood money. I understand, replied Ennis. He rubbed the back of his neck. I sure hate it for Sarah. Sarah? Yeah, my baby sister. Ty took care of her ever since her husband Bob passed away about three years ago. Suddenly, a thought hit Jubal. Sheriff, I changed my mind about that reward. You have? Yes, sir, I have. Well, like I said, there's some papers I need filling out. He bent a thumb towards his office. Blount had Jubal write out a short summary of what happened in the streets of Hillsboro. Then he asked him to sign his name at the bottom. I'll get this off today. Your money should be here in about two weeks. Where do you want me to send it? Nowhere, Sheriff. I want Mrs. Sarah to have it. Blount was a man's man. Rarely, if ever, did he spill tears. Yet, as he stood to shake Jubal's hand, his eyes leaked. With a broken voice, he said, That's a mighty fine thing you're doing, son. He saw Jubal's badge and brushed it with his hand. You're gonna make a fine law, man. Whereabouts are you, Sheriffin? Glen Rose, Texas. 
Glenn Rose. Anders rubbed his chin and pointed his finger. You watch yourself, Stone. That town, like Hillsboro, he tapped his finger several times on the desktop. It's stomping grounds for high binders like Slade and his cut. They ride clear of the big towns like Fort Worth, Dallas, and Waco. Thanks for the warning, Sheriff. Jubal walked toward the door. He didn't want to wear out his welcome. After all, he'd only been in Hillsboro for an hour and had already killed one man and riled two others, including Billy. Yet he couldn't make himself leave without asking his question. With hat in hand, he turned on his heels and stared at Blount. Ennis caught his gaze. You forget some. Jubal scratched his head. I was just wondering if you knew Sheriff Monty Peel of Palestine. Ennis pounded his desk with a fist, threw back his head, and laughed loudly. That old horse thief, how do you know him? From Blount's expression, Jubal figured the two of them had a friend in common. He was right. I was his deputy back in Palestine. Ennis stood to his feet and his mouth flung open. Are you Joe Stone's son of Abilene? Jubal pointed his hat at Blount. <laughs> you knew my pa? Son, every lawman in Texas that's worth his salt knows the name Joe Stone. From when I hear about you, you're tracking your pa's boot prints right well. Stone grinned and wagged his head. <laughs> I ain't near the man my pa was. Well, son, being a lawman in the likes of your pa takes a lot of wet blankets and many days in the saddle. You don't just wake up one day knowing how to kill snakes. Jubal nodded, but not because he fully understood Blount's words. Ennis read his confusion. What I'm saying, Jubal, is that your pa didn't just wake up one day and become one of the best that's ever wore a Texas badge. It took him a better part of 20 years. <laughs> Obliged, Sheriff. 20 years, you say? Reckon if I can stay alive that long, maybe one day I'll measure up to the top of my pa's boots. From what I hear from Monty Peel, the way you handle your shooting pace, you're well on your way, son. Jubal looked befuddled. Blount chuckled. Oh yeah, me and Peel is good friends. He sent me a wire a few days ago telling me you'd be heading this way to be on the lookout. Monty thinks a lot of you, Jubal. Ennis's words brought Jubal much pleasure. After sharing a cup of coffee, they shook hands and Jubal walked Red down to the livery. The next morning, after a good night's rest for both of them, Stone saddled the roan and led him to the front on one of the dry goods stores. Inside, he bought some bacon, coffee, flour, and beans. Then walked up the boardwalk for breakfast at Butler's Cafe. Why, Mr. Stone, come right on in. Would you like to the same table? Yes, sir, that will be fine. Several of the townsfolk saw Stone enter the cafe and followed. They wanted to take a closer look at the fast gun. The man who now had killed two well-known Texas outlaws. Walter saw them gathering at the door and with a large smile waved them inside. How about some flapjacks and sausage, Mr. Stone? Sounds good, and a cup of coffee. Why, certainly. Linda! Oh, Linda! His daughter came out of the kitchen and greeted Jubal with a smile. Good morning, Mr. Stone. How are you? Fine as gravy, Linda. And you? Butler's face exuded satisfaction. Well, I'll leave you two to talk. As he walked to another table, Linda rolled her eyes. I reckon we're engaged now, Mr. Stone, as far as Pa is concerned. Jubal chuckled. It would be my pleasure, Miss Linda, but I'm afraid Billy may object. Just as he spoke those words, in walked the young man who had stolen her heart, Billy Cole. Haven't you better get back to the livery, son? Henry will be looking for you. Billy pulled off his hat and lowered it to his side. He was doing his level best to show respect. Mr. Butler, what do you have against me, sir? To my knowledge, I have never done you no harm. And as for your daughter, I... Before he could finish, Butler shoved him towards the door. I've told you, Mr. Cole, to stay away from Linda. Now please don't come back here. If you do, I'll have you arrested. Linda and Jubal, along with most of the other customers, heard Walter's harsh words from across the room and saw the look on Billy's face when he left. Linda threw her hands to her face and ran back towards the kitchen. Everything's all right, folks, said Butler as he walked from table to table. Just a misunderstanding. Please enjoy your meal. He looked back towards the kitchen. Linda! Linda! When she didn't answer, Walter hurried Jubal's way. That girl, where is she now? Jubal hadn't planned on saying more than he already had about Billy, but Butler's ill-treatment of the young man this morning had him on the prod. 
As Linda's paw walked by, Jubal stood to his feet. Mr. Butler, could I have a word with you? He stared toward the kitchen doors. Let me get Linda first. Customers are waiting. Sir, said Jubal with a serious look, this won't take but a minute. Please have a seat. Walter pulled out the chair hastily and sat. With great concern, he leaned across the table. What is it, Mrs. Stone? Is it your food? I can get you something else if you're not satisfied. No, sir, the grub is fine. I want to speak to you about Linda. Butler clasped his hands and grinned like a possum. Why, yes, of course, and with great pleasure, I might add. Well, truth is, it's more about Billy than it is Linda. Oh, don't worry about him. He waved the cloth he was holding toward the door. I just shoot him away, and he best not return. Butler was acting as if he was a big hog at the trough, but Jubal knew different. He was thinking. Billy Cole could have whipped him with one fist tied behind his back. Jubal hankered to reach over and thumped him, but he restrained himself. Butler continued. As I said, Butler is a seven by nine kind of fellow, Mr. Stone. Jubal looked Butler in the eye. Sir, I know that I'm reaching at a bag of nails here, but I'd like to tell you something. By all means, Mrs. Stone, please. Stone noticed Butler's prominent Adam's apple. Each time he spoke, it moved up and down his throat, rubbing against his skin as if at any moment it could pop out. Perhaps it was because the restaurant owner thought Jubal's next words were leading up to a marriage proposal for his daughter. How wrong he was. Two years ago, I jumped a train and rode the rails to Palestine, Texas. Didn't have a nickel to my name. I walked to the edge of town. It was raining. So I found me a lean-to to wait it out and fell asleep. Woke up to a big frame sheriff kicking my boot and questioning me about a murder on one of the rail cars. I ended up being his deputy for the next two years. Stone pulled back his coat and stared down at his badge. He took a chance with me, and now the people at Glen Rose are about to do the same. Walter was still wearing a plastered smile as he seemed infatuated with Jubal's words. Then his demeanor suddenly went sour when he heard Stones' next words. Maybe Billy Cole needs someone to take a chance on him. Butler shook his head and started to reply, but Jubal interrupted. Sir, it seems a little strange to me that you'd throw your daughter towards a man who, as far as you're concerned, is only known for killing two well-known outlaws. With that, Butler rose from the table and brushed down his apron. Pushing the chair back under the table, he simply said, Good day to you, Mr. Stone. Please come again. Linda had her ear pressed to the kitchen door and heard most of the conversation. She grabbed up a platter of food the cook had prepared and rushed out of the kitchen. As she passed Jubal's table, she threw her head toward him and whispered, Thank you, Mr. Stone, for speaking up for Billy. Maybe your words will sink in with Pa. Jubal picked up his hat resting on the seat of the chair next to him and flipped it atop his head. He put his hands on the table and stood up. Reaching into his pants pocket, he pulled out a small wad of cash and peeled off two bills. As he walked toward the door, he tipped his hat to Butler across the room. It was time for him and Red to ride. He stepped down off the stoop and to the hitch. He pulled the knot out of the end of his reins and then came loose from the rail. He swung up in his saddle and looked up across the street to a Sheriff Blount, who waved as he leaned against a post outside his office. Watch your back, Jubal. Yes, sir, Jubal yelled in response. Ennis hoped that he had not seen or heard the last of this young Texas lawman destined to make his mark on the frontier, and became every bit the cut of his paw, legendary Joe Stone. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Blood Trail to Hell, by Casey Nash.